Anyway, um, Arya is a very modest man. He's a he's a, a, a very talented physician, researcher in his own right. And then in the area of synthetic gems, he's probably one of the world's leading experts, if not the. And uh, I've talked to other people in the area of synthetic gems, and they they all vaunt uh, to the skies how knowledgeable and uh, and and accomplished Arya is. So I'm so pleased that we could have him today to speak with us regarding the synthetic simulants of diamonds. And this is the last in a sort of mini series we've done on diamonds and their imitants or, or dam diamonds and their uh, alternatives. And so um, I'd like to thank you, Aria, for your patience. I'd like to thank everyone else for their patience. And before we get got started, I want to say right ahead, in case anybody leaves us <laughs> along the way, is that next month we're going to have a really interesting program on the on the cause and the information about uh, color change gems, and we're going to have Dr. Aaron Paulke from GIA, as well as um, oh dear me, my brain just went dead. Um, I, the oh, we uh, before the program's over, I'll let you know who the other guy is. But uh, he's also very famous for his knowledge about and his contribution to our knowledge about the reasons for color in gemstones. So anyway, Aria, thank you. Appreciate it. I'm really looking forward to seeing what you have to say. And I hope you all will enjoy what, what we're going to hear from now. Thank you. Much appreciated. Um, Jolion, would you mind letting me share screen? Um, I can't actually share my screen right now. Yeah, it's saying that uh, host disabled participant screen sharing. So just whenever you're able to, to get that, I can get started. All right, so while we try to get that up and running, I can go ahead and do this without uh, some of the introductory PowerPoint screens. Uh, those are just like some texts on a screen. So I'm happy to just run through things while we're working out the last of the uh, logistic and technological issues. So when we are talking about basically the diamond simulant, there's a couple of things we wanna know. So like what makes a good diamond simulant? What are the properties of diamond that are um, valuable to us, both optically and mechanically. Why do people have interest in these particular gems? And so we're going to start from there. We're going to kind of work our way through things. And then we're going to hit kind of the most common, most economically important um, synthetics, as well as some of these new exotic ones that are making their way to market. Um, and then just as an aside, when we use the phrase exotic diamond simulants, that really just refers to any synthetic that has a refractive index greater than about two um, or a dispersion greater than about 0 0.04 or 40, depending on how you want to look at it. Um, we're just going to kind of define a couple of our terms here. So when we say synthetic, that really just refers to any gemstone that was grown in a laboratory. Um, doesn't matter what the material is, just that's what we're going to say is synthetic. When we use the word simulant, so that is different. Um, a simulant is basically any gemstone that is sold in a way that suggests that it's being used to replace or mimic something else. So for example, sometimes purple cubic zirconia is sold as amethyst simulant. I mean, clearly it's not amethyst. It just has the same color as it. Um, all right, we got some screen sharing up. So give me a second and we will get that going. All right, um, somebody just let me know if you can see the, the screen that I've got up. Hopefully that's uh, that's coming through. Yeah, we can yes. see it, thanks. Perfect, all right, so now we've got, uh, we've got these uh, PowerPoint slides up. So the other example of a simulant is natural white zircon. So historically people would heat treat their zircon, get it to look white, and then they would say, oh, this, is a replacement for diamond. So that's just what a simulant is. When we use the phrase diamond simulants, so you might hear the phrase historic diamond simulant, core diamond simulant, or exotic diamond simulant, it's really not a good term for us to be using in the industry. So really you should be referring to these as the high RI, high dispersion synthetics. Um, just a point of clarification. 
When we look at the core diamond simulants, those are the historically offered gems that were grown specifically for gemstone use, whereas the exotic diamond simulants are the ones that were grown for technical use, industrial use, radiation physics that were never intended to be sold as jewelry, but that have made their way to the gemstone industry anyway. Right. So what makes a good diamond simulant? So we kind of talked about this already, but the refractive index. So diamond's refractive index is 2.42, and we want to shoot for somewhere in that range. Um, really, once you start getting above 2.1, 2.2, they all look kind of the same. So just shooting for that range or above. When we look at dispersion, diamond, to be quite frank, doesn't have that high of a dispersion. Compared to most of the natural gemstones we're looking at, sure, yeah, 44 is high. But compared to the synthetics, there are a lot of synthetics that have just much higher dispersion. And for diamond simulants in particular, we want to make sure that we're not getting too much fire. That's actually the bigger problem for us. And then the last thing is that diamond is cubic. So there's no birefringence, there's no facet doubling, there's no pleochroism. From a mechanical perspective, part of the reason that diamonds are so widely used in jewelry is because they are hard. So a most hardness of 10. Realistically, we just want something in a synthetic that's hard enough to wear for daily use. It doesn't necessarily have to be that hard, but higher hardness is always better. All right, so looking at some history, um, this is taken from a 1981 article from Gems and Gemology. So first diamond simulants ever used were natural zircon and then some other materials like glasses and ceramics. Once gemstone synthesis started becoming possible, so after the Vernonville process was developed in 1904, we started seeing white sapphire and white spinel because those were hard enough to wear on a daily basis. But if you think about the refractive index and their dispersion, that's just way too low. So post-World War II, we started seeing this big resurgence of the development of new synthetics, in part because of the Cold War, in part because of their technological use. The first one was actually rutile, so titanium oxide. Um, it didn't really have a huge impact in the industry. It was produced in some small volumes, uh, really kind of disappeared by the late 50s as a commonly used synthetic, and that was mainly because of its hardness, if not super hard. Strontium titanate was developed very specifically for technological use, but rapidly gained popularity because of its ability to simulate diamond. So it switched from technological use to gemstone use and then back to technological use. It's not so much used as a gemstone anymore. Once yttrium aluminum garnet was developed, that was when we really started seeing good diamond simulants. Its refractive index isn't quite that high, but it has a dispersion that's pretty close. And more importantly, YAG has a hardness of 8.5. So we see that once that started becoming in production, the amount being produced specifically for gemstones just blew everything else out of the water. People loved it. It was great. And it really took us until the development of cubic zirconia to have a better replacement for it. And again, CZ has a, an even closer refractive index, uh, slightly better dispersion, um, again, hard enough to use for daily wear. So that's kind of how we worked our way through things historically. And why is this relevant to us? So in the gem and jewelry industry, sure, we've seen like synthetics come and go. Um, depending on mine production, some materials are only available as synthetics in like some decades. So there's a couple of things that are really relevant to us from this particular side of things. One is that the market is becoming more educated. So as these uh, consumers who have had like a university education, grad degrees, things like that, as these people are making their way into the, their ages where they'd be buying gems and jewelry, they're also being met with more educational resources online, teaching them about natural gems, but also synthetics. Um, in particular, there's better resources now about the high RI, high dispersion synthetics, People are looking for alternatives to diamonds, things like that. And a lot of these new vendors have really, really good social media outreach. So things like constant posts on Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, YouTube, all that kind of stuff. So that's serving to take this already expanding market and really, really aggressively develop it. We also have to look at overall market changes. So you, I'm sure most of you have seen that Sapphire engagement rings have become dramatically popular. Um, that's now a routine option. It's not even considered unusual anymore. 
Uh, there are other gemstones that weren't really sellable. So things like gray spinel that just nobody wanted. Uh, once an advertising campaign comes around or once it becomes a trend, the global knowledge of that becomes widely available and that starts to become popular as well. And we're seeing this trend kind of continue and it's fairly consistent in that all of these unique special feature gems, um, some of these exotic scientific materials, once the market really like gets a sense of them, that niche market slowly expands over time. And at least in the past two decades, we've seen that that has maintained, um, unlike in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, where there was a big peak and then a drop off. We're seeing that now that interest is being maintained in part because of the internet. And then sure, part of it's also that there's a lot of these scientific equipment manufacturers who just have leftover broken bits and they need something to do with. And to be quite frank, it's too expensive to recycle some of these. So when you have enterprising people who are like, I'm a gem cutter or I'm a rough dealer, can I buy your scraps? Then this stuff starts making it to market. So again, kind of looking at our timeline, uh, just the dates over on the left. If you take a look at this little chart on the bottom right, you'll see kind of the relationships between hardness, refractive index, dispersion. Uh, some of these just don't have good dispersion, so they didn't really make good diamond simulants. Some of them have way more than diamond. And again, the hardness is just drastically variable, anywhere from five to nine and a half. So that means we really got to take a closer look at things. And we'll start out kind of running through order by refractive index. We'll start from kind of the least refractive and then work our way upwards. So that way we're not necessarily perfectly, but it's a good analog for slowly making our way towards diamond. So yttrium aluminum garnet um, has probably the lowest refractive index out of any of these, but it's still higher than most natural gems. That's the important thing to remember. So really only things like sphene and zircon are gonna have a higher refractive index. The dispersion isn't great, but it's definitely higher than sapphire and spinel, which were some of the previous options. And because it's got a hardness of 8.5, it's totally appropriate for daily wear. Given these properties, it's a totally great gemstone in its own right. And honestly, it shouldn't really be thought of as a diamond simulant. It should just be thought of as another tool in our armamentarium that we can provide to clients. Comes in a whole bunch of different colors. Uh, the two most commercially relevant to us right now are the Pariba colored YAG, which is colored by Euterbium, and then the nuclear yellow YAG that genuinely has a glow to it because of the way its fluorescence works, and that's colored by cerium. Uh, because this is produced pretty routinely for uh, technical, uh, technical uses in industry, they make their way to uh, fasteners pretty often. When we look at GGG, so another synthetic garnet, it's kind of an oddball. Uh, it doesn't have an impressive refractive index, doesn't have a repressive, impressive dispersion. It's soft, so it can't really be used in a daily wear ring. For a few brief years when people were considering using this as a common gemstone, there were lots of different colors being grown, but nowadays it's pretty limited. Um, the colors don't really have much use in industry, so most of the material that gets uh, becomes available to fasteners is white, and generally it doesn't get to fasteners anymore. So cubic zirconia. This is really our first good diamond simulant, and it's, again, an excellent gem in its own merit. Uh, it's got a comfortably high refractive index, high dispersion, a little bit higher than diamond, and it's hard enough for daily wear. More importantly, as of now, there's still a ton of companies who are growing this in basically every color. So all 13 major gemological colors, multiple different saturation levels. Um, there were even 16 historically produced color change formulas including this purple to green one that you see in the bottom picture. But most of those aren't really produced anymore. I'm not really sure why, kind of sad, but that's uh, how it is. So if you're going for an optically active synthetic with good color, really cubic zirconia is your best bet. There's a couple of things to be aware of. So one, it's grown by the skull melt process. And that produces these long vertical columns of crystals that slowly fuse together along the sides. But if you get a piece of rough where the columns haven't fused completely, then typically there's some polishing difficulties, unusual brittleness, sometimes it can crack. And that's where one of these misconceptions about difficulty polishing comes from. The stabilizing agents used, so either calcium or yttrium, uh, can impact the hardness, the optical properties, and the uh, brittleness. So really the modern yttrium stabilized zirconia doesn't have any of the problems that the historic production from the 70s and 80s did. 
There's also a couple of urban legends about cubic zirconia, which are really frustrating, like the idea that it's porous, which is not true, that it becomes cloudy over time, has never been true, um, and that it somehow absorbs hand lotion or skin oils, has never been true. None of these are true. None of them were ever true. They just kind of stem from a public's misunderstanding of how gems become cloudy as the surface abrades, or if grime builds up on the bottom of a pavilion, it makes the stone look cloudy and dull. So again, those are just urban legends. Feel free to just ignore them, throw them out of your mind. As we're working our way up in refractive index, we start to get some really interesting gems. So strontium tightening. This is really more of a technical crystal, but thanks in part to some new consumer preferences, um, it's making a solid comeback. The refractive index itself is almost identical to diamond, but this material has five times more dispersion. So, and like a good precision gem cutter, who knows gemstone design will be able to take advantage of this and make, quite frankly, this gem launch rainbows across the room. Um, the one big disadvantage to this is that it's a bit softer, so it's really only good for pendants or occasional use rings. While the material is pretty easy to grow, it's grown the same way that sapphire and spinel are, there's not really a lot of use in industry, and there's not really any use for the colored variants either. So the previously available blues and reds and purples really don't get grown that much anymore, so they never really make it into the hands of fasteners. Moissanite, newest of these materials, definitely the best diamond simulant currently available. I mean, also, it's a great gemstone in its own right. Has a refractive index slightly higher than diamond, and it's twice as dispersive. It's also harder than sapphire, which makes it perfect for engagement rings, wedding rings, daily use. Uh, I personally dropped it on the floor and had no problems, no chipping, no scratching, nothing. So great option. When you're growing moissanite, pure white moissanite is hard to produce. And when you mess up moissanite in any way, it turns green. So green moissanite, very readily available. Nowadays, because there's so many producers growing it, it's fairly easy to find yellows, greens, cyan, um, off-white, even DEF color, just straight up white moissanite is now pretty available to the hands of faceters. Um, and researchers have finally started being able to produce consistent blue, purples, reds, and oranges, although those really haven't quite made it to market yet in a consistent manner. The important thing for moissanite to remember is that there's three major types that are currently available. There's 3C, 4H, and 6H, each of which is slightly different. 3C is always gonna be at least a little bit yellow. It's also the hardest. 6H comes in a bunch of different colors, but if this material gets hot or during certain parts of polishing and pre-polishing, it can actually start to yellow or gray a little bit. 4H is the most color stable, but tends to be a little bit brittle. Okay, now we get to just quite frankly, the best of all of these gemstones, which is synthetic rutile. So titanium oxide, this gem material has the highest refractive index of any non-toxic gemstone, and it has the single highest dispersion of any gem material ever described. Um, you might see in older literature that the dispersion is given as 0.280. That's actually wrong. It's higher than that. Um, it has such high dispersion that this can actually cause the overall stone's brightness to decrease because so much of that light is getting split into the colors of the rainbow. Um, you can kind of see that in a second picture that I took, so the bottom picture. Uh, that's the world's largest synthetic rutile ever cut, which I just finished a couple of months ago. And the lighting conditions that I used for that are not so great. But even with that terrible lighting, you can still see that the fitting is just like vomiting rainbows everywhere, which is wonderful. Um, the stone is a little bit soft, but both historic manufacturers and current manufacturers are adding certain doping agents. So adding aluminum or adding zirconium metal to it that increase the hardness and get rid of the off yellow, off gray tones to give you a pure white color like the stone on top. Um, it used to be grown in mass production for gemstone use, uh, but Java in Switzerland went bankrupt. Union Carbide doesn't do that anymore and they got bought out. National Lead Company stopped decades ago, uh, but there are some manufacturers that have picked this back up. So RG Crystals in Bangkok is now growing this with a different method and they're adding some more of these doping agents to make it harder. So if you've got historic material produced in the 60s and 70s, probably has a hardness of six, six and a half. If you're getting the material that's being produced now, depending on the concentration of those agents that they add, could be anywhere from six and a half 
to almost eight, like 7.75 ish. Um, just kind of depends. You got to test it out while you're cutting it. And now for like the very end of the production of synthetics, there's a lot of interest for some reason in these new, very high refractive index, very high dispersion synthetics. Um, these come from a whole bunch of different industries. So like cell phone components, electronics, nuclear physics, uh, because there's enough of these broken bits that are now available, there's more and more fasteners who are producing them, and there's more and more client side interest in getting these. So just things for you to all be aware of. Um, you may run into some of these more than others, but uh, really the two most accessible ones are linabate, which is lithium niobate, and tantalia, which is lithium tantalate. Uh, linabate is always pure white has a very high birefringence, so lots of facet doubling depending on how you orient it. And that's the picture on the left. Um, it's a little bit brittle, not ideal for daily wear use, but totally fine for pendant or earrings, things like that. The same applies for Tantalia. It's a little bit tougher, it's less soft. Uh, similar principles apply. Zincite and Spalarite have both been around for decades. Um, zincite is typically found in zinc smelting plants as a, an accidental bride product, um, sphalerite. There's the natural equivalent, but people are producing it as a synthetic for various uh, research purposes. And both of those are now somewhat available to the general public. The more rare ones that you may not come across, um, things like wakefieldite. So that is an unusual material that has a pink to purple to green color change. Um, the various bismuth containing materials if you come across a high refractive index, high dispersion synthetic, that's just extremely dense, much more so than cubic zirconia, much, much more so than yet. Basically, the two of the five most dense gem materials that have ever been discovered are among these. So if you pick something up and you're like, oh, this rock is a good four times heavier than it should be, probably one of those. So we've kind of run through things quickly. I had to like truncate this talk to, to make sure that we had enough time and like finished on time. But that's basically the end of our whirlwind tour. Uh, happy to take any questions that anybody has for now. Well, I'd like to throw one in there, Aria. Um, my friend, uh, Ed Perry, who does um, Hyper Edge Labs, uh, actually the, the interesting thought Ray, I think your um, camera might have frozen. Diamond covered and, and, and filled. Uh, can we try again? Is that better? Yeah, that's better. OK. Uh, they, don't, they don't need to see me to hear me, I got no. <laughs> but anyway, the, the, that he had developed the, uh, the present day hyperage lap to deal with the polishing issues that came with um, uh, the one you were just talking about. Oh. I took too long getting there. Um, yeah. Moissanite. And initially what happened was when they were trying to polish Moissanite, it turned black. And so it was um, it was an extreme challenge to cut. And, and so the newest the newest um, iteration of the hyperage laps were evolved to to actually um, make it possible to cut Moissanite more effectively and, uh, and and get closer to pure white in the finished stone rather than the grays and blacks that it happened from overheating or whatever it was. Yeah. So one of the big issues with uh, commercially available moissanite that was making its way to like faster's hands was that it was predominantly the 6H subtype. And, and that material was probably the most prone out of any of them to have that effect happen. Nowadays, the like market production has generally shifted away from 6H, which historically was easier towards 4-H, which is a little bit more difficult to produce, but it doesn't have as much of like the yellowing problems or things like that. So now these big cutting houses, when they're sending their material off to have like mass market moissanite cut, they don't have to worry about the yellowing. Um, or, I mean, not as much. You still kind of have to worry about it. And now with some of these newer technologies, so like Ed Perry's HyperEdge Lab, um, or the use of some of these water dissolvable diamond products for polishing. Um, those 
allow changes at the surface level as well as much lower temperatures during polishing that help prevent that from happening. And then it looks like Sarah has a question. Uh, thoughts on synthetic black moissanite versus black diamonds. Um, yeah, so identifying the difference between synthetic uh, synthetic black diamonds, black moissanite, and other like natural diamonds and things like that. To be quite honest, I am terrible with ID for gemstones. I just run everything through a Raman spectrum, <laughs> um, which is probably the nuclear option. But um, uh, I'm really not sure how you would do that generally in practice. Um, the black moissanite is probably the easiest to identify. Um, most black moissanite, if you shine a bright enough light through it, you'll see that it actually has this kind of gross olive green brown color. Um, you need a really, really bright light to see that, but you can see it. Um, not really sure about the lab grown diamonds and things like that though. When I was at the Canadian Gemological Conference, one of the things that was brought up that, that actually made me very uncomfortable was the fact that with the new generation of synthetic diamonds um, and the testers that we, like I've spent a lot of money to get a moissanite tester. And now I'm told that it, it may not be useful because um, there's some, there can be confusion um, with the readings from um, even from synthetic and natural diamonds and moissanite, um, depending on which type they are. And I thought, oh my goodness, um, what do we do yeah. now? So if I remember correctly, I think 24R moissanite, and that's one that's not really commercially available yet, but 24R shows up very similarly on some of these like electronic testers, like the, the diamond testers that do electrical conductivity and thermal conductivity. Um, if that stuff ends up being widely available, that will be fairly problematic for us. And that means that you'd have to like look for facet doubling or other things like that. But moissanite can also be oriented to hide almost all of its facet doubling. So that, um, it is a difficult question for the industry and I'm not really sure how we're going to end up answering it. I I do think I vaguely remember some mention of fluorescence might be one of the options for differentiation, although I'm uncertain as to what the fluorescent properties are of moissanite. Yeah, that's uh, that's a question that I'll have to ask some of the scientists at uh, Tucson. Um, all right, happy to take any other questions that anybody might have. Uh, about any of these synthetics, any other synthetics, um, feel free. I hate to tell you, but this has been one of the shyest audiences I've ever worked with. So the fact that you got one question, I'm actually very impressed. But it also bespeaks uh, highly of your ability to, to cover the topic. Uh, so completely that people don't have questions. You can always look oh, at, look at uh, that. That's much appreciated. Um, and I'm always happy to give out uh, my email is fasting101 at gmail.com and I'll type it into the chat. When are you going down to Tucson, by the way? Um, I get in late tomorrow night. Um, okay, so question about uh, hands and eyes. All right. Okay, so Ray, I'm going to answer this uh, question that we've got about synthetic tanzanite. Um, so synthetics versus artificial stones. So these are, uh, unfortunately, people use a lot of these terms in ways that they're not supposed to. Um, there's actually, in the U.S., there's Federal Trade Commission regulations on how these terms can be used. Um, when people use the term artificial gemstone, that is supposed to exclusively refer to a gemstone that doesn't occur in nature, but can only be grown in a laboratory. So that would be things like lithium niobate or um, cubic zirconia, which for the most part doesn't really exist in nature. Um, synthetics can be either a natural gemstone, like a gemstone that occurs in nature that was then produced in a lab or a gemstone that doesn't occur in nature that was also produced in a lab. So, for example, um, moissanite, um, 
cubic zirconia, but also sapphire can all be synthetic, meaning they can all be grown in a lab. But of that set of uh, materials, only sapphire is commonly found in nature. Um, when we're looking at tanzanite, there is no synthetic tanzanite, but there is, and, and again, we're going to use more confusing terms, there is a simulant tanzanite. So it's a different material. It's, uh, it's forced, right? It's related to peridot, but it looks almost identical to tanzanite. So people will sell it. They'll say, like, we're selling you cobalt forced, right? It's a tanzanite simulant. Um, so that's, uh, that's the closest thing we have. Uh, and then we've got a question from John Scott. What is that? What is it that distinguishes the different moissanite types? So moissanite has a lot of different ways that the silicon and carbon can stack with each other. Um, so they're typically given a number and then a letter. That letter refers to the crystal habit. So in 3C, that's the only moissanite type that is cubic, which is kind of like diamond. Um, so 3C moissanite has no pleochroism. It has no birefringence. It has no facet doubling at all. Um, and then we look at the other ones. There's H, which is hexagonal. And then there's R, which I think is rhombohedral. Um, and then those numbers refer to, I honestly don't remember at this point. Um, I'm sure I could go back and look it up. But it basically relates to how the atoms stack in the, the crystal unit. Um, got another oh, okay. And then, in your opinion, is there a new synthetic material that may replace moistenite in the marketplace? To be quite honest, I don't think so, other than synthetic diamond. Um, there's from uh, like first principles testing. So at this point, we've got good enough computer simulation to run hundreds of thousands of different possible crystals or like that nobody's grown before, but we can run their theoretical properties through these like machine learning systems and artificial intelligence systems. And they'll tell us like, what are the properties gonna be? And to the best of my knowledge, nobody has found anything that's expected to be hardness over nine, um, that's also expected to have a high enough refractive index. That's also expected to have a uh, dispersion that's in that same window. That's also going to be transparent in visible light. So one of the big problems is that a lot of these materials are black. They're just that that's the way they are. Um, so having the right combination of all of these, nothing that I'm aware of now things that have similar optical properties, but are softer, absolutely. Things that don't have good optical properties, but are very, very hard, yeah. Um, so things like aluminum nitride, uh, extraordinarily hard. Not super great optically, like it's, it's closer to cubic zirconia or a little bit less. So you'd think that, hey, like if this stuff was easy to grow, people would use it except it produces horrifyingly toxic like nitrogen oxide compounds while you're faceting it. And those are extremely poisonous. You don't want to be breathing anywhere near those. So it's not really something that'll make it to industry. I own a piece and I, I'm never going to cut it just because it's too unsafe. I can almost hear the jet engines heating up for your trip to Tucson. Go <laughs> oh, man. All right, can I just ask a question orally? Sure. Sorry, I, I can't type in. Does that mean that if I can, if there's a material that's synthesized that meets the tolerance for diamonds for refractance, for disper or dispersion and hardness and isn't toxic, does that mean that whatever it is, you would classify it as a diamond? So if, so like if I personally had something come across my desk and it had the correct refractive index and it had the correct dispersion and it had the correct properties, I would feel like I wouldn't be able to 100% guarantee that it was a diamond, but because there's nothing else out there that meets those criteria, like I wouldn't even bother with definitive testing. I wouldn't bother to send it to a lab. I would just say, yeah, this is probably a diamond. But how are you covering this term of naturally occurring? 
how would you test naturally occurring? That seems to be the biggest thing. Yeah. So synthetic diamonds, so diamonds grown in a lab typically have basically like electric de uh, defects in the material. Um, there's certain other contaminants that they have just from the way that the vapor deposition process happens that change the fluorescence properties, that change some of these other properties. There's no way to test for those with the common testing equipment. You need like specialized photoluminescence testing that you would typically only see at, let's say, GIA's head office in Carlsbad or AGL's head office. Um, or you would need something like an ultra high resolution Raman spectrophotometer, uh, which I think is like $230,000 US. And most people don't have access to that. So, so unfortunately, like for some of these newer generations of diamonds grown in a lab versus diamonds found in nature, that's, um, that is a, a hard thing to test. No. Thank you. That's what I, I have the, the analogy I'm thinking of is emeralds. And oh, yeah. yes, because emeralds that are, are uh, in the lab, they're beautiful. They're flawless. And I've never seen a, a naturally occurring uh, emerald that has so few flaws in it. So this, this term naturally occurring is for me hard to, to uh, ever quantify or yeah. qualify. Yeah, uh, there's... Um... Oh, who was it? There was a Japanese firm that grew flux-grown emeralds that were essentially indistinguishable from natural, um, from like the highest quality natural stones until a couple of years ago when our, like some of the techniques that we use to definitively identify gems vaporize tiny portions of the gem material and then test the elements that come out of it. And we only had the, like, that technology only recently improved to the point where we could actually demonstrate like, yeah, we would like, you could buy from this Japanese manufacturer and you knew like they grew it, but if you sent it to a lab, they wouldn't be able to tell. And it was only until now that we got the ability to do that. So I think as technology improves, um, we'll be able to do that, but there's always that arms race between growers, um, some of the less scrupulous growers who want to grow things in a lab and then say that it's natural so they get more money and then the labs that test things. So do you ever see the formation of something like Providence? Like for, for example, in paintings, uh, a painting is considered part of its valid, uh, as being authentic of a historic piece is its Providence that can be traced back of ownership. So for naturally occurring, would Providence be of where it was located and uh, the firm that was there? Like, is there a movement towards Providence? Yeah. So that definitely has exploded in popularity for natural gems, but it's also becoming very prominent in lab-grown gems. And I'll give you an example. Um, there were sapphires grown by the flame fusion process from one company in Switzerland. And that one company in Switzerland used the most, uh, like the most detailed quality control, and they controlled their ingredients as aggressively as possible. They used solar power and they produced their own uh, like oxygen and hydrogen to use in their flames. They recycled aluminum from like cans, I think, and used that to grow their sapphires. So these were basically the, like the most um, ecologically green lab grown sapphires that you could find. And they also had the highest quality of that type of production. So now because of that company has gone bankrupt, um, if you are able to prove in the, the like current synthetics market um, or in the high-end synthetics market, if you're able to prove that that material was grown by that company, and even better, if you have like a proof of sale, um, then you can actually charge a little bit of a premium. And I've seen up to a 20% premium on those sapphires. So yeah, 100%. Oh, video is glitching out here. Whoop, what happened there? Yeah, so 100%. Uh, the provenance of a synthetic gemstone is becoming a thing. Just a quick aside, and I just of interest is that when they did the crown jewels of Iran and estimated their value and tried to estimate their their origins and everything, they ran into a problem. Is they they ran into this this stone, this green stone that looked like an emerald, smelled like an emerald, 
fit, fitted all the tests except it was flawless. And so it was a result of their work that we're able to include in the definition of emerald, naturally occurring emerald, plus emeralds, even though they're extremely rare. So it was, it's one of those things that it can be created synthetically, but it actually did occur in nature. Yeah. And then uh, it looks like we've got a question from Anna. Would you be able to go into more detail about synthetic rutile? I'm so curious. Happy to do so. That's actually one of my favorite uh, lab-grown gems. So rutile, and some people pronounce it rutile. It just depends on like what country you're in. Um, so synthetic rutile is titanium oxide. Um, it used to be grown by the flame fusion method, so the same way that you would grow sapphires and spinels. But because its melting point is so much higher, there's a lot of additional like technical work that has to go into your equipment. It costs much more to grow it that way. And there's a lot of uses for that material in industry. So once these dedicated gemstone growing companies stopped producing it, that material basically stopped making its way into fasteners' hands, and it was comparatively hard to get. Um, so if we think about the flame fusion material, that stuff, when they would grow it for gemstone use, they would typically add a little bit of aluminum, because otherwise it has a, like a strong yellow color or like a grayish green color. Um, so they would add a little bit of aluminum to make it a little bit harder, a little bit whiter. When the material itself is grown, it's typically dark blue or black, and it has to be heated um, to like 1500 degrees Celsius for 24 hours for it to become transparent. And that process is also expensive because it takes a lot of energy to produce those levels of heat and you got to cook it for a long time. So as that material started kind of exiting the market and we stopped getting access to it, um, there were a couple of companies that identified like, hey, we can be the big producers of this material. Um, so... Oxide Corp in Japan, which no longer does it, uh, picked up the production again and had sold a couple of uh, kilos of larger material. And then RG Crystals in Bangkok had started using a different method to produce it. That's um, because it's the same method as cubic zirconia. They already had the setup to do it. They didn't need any of the special equipment modifications to do it. So that's allowed the production of synthetic rutile that's more readily available to faceters. It's less expensive. Um, they're still working on the size. The pieces aren't nearly as big as one would hope, but still good pieces. When we look at the actual gemstone itself, so like cutting and working the gemstone, um, if you've worked a lot with synthetic sapphire, you might notice that there are certain directions in sapphire that are harder than others. We call that anisotropic hardness. So you might have two facets that take forever to polish, two facets that are next door that polish really quickly. Rutile has the same effect. Since the stone's generally softer, it doesn't really cause any problems, but sometimes you'll notice that certain facets polish faster than others. The other thing is that because of its just absurd optical properties, remember this has the absolute highest refractive index, by far highest dispersion of any gem material. Uh, it's hard to take a pre-existing design. So like a standard round brilliant that you would use for diamonds or even the variants of a standard round brilliant that you would use for other gemstones, you can't use in rutile because it will end up looking bad. Um, you have to substantially change the angles and proportions. When you do that, you end up with a gemstone that looks way better than diamond or whatever else it was cut in. Um, but if you don't make those changes, it just doesn't look good. Uh, the same applies for custom designs. Most gemstones you expect to have certain ratios of their height to width ratio or like the table size. But 100% of those rules go out the window when you're working with something like rutile or strontium titanate because their optical properties are just so exaggeratedly extreme that you really need computer modeling to be able to work with them properly. Uh, that's part of the reason that we're seeing a resurgence in the market now is because our computer modeling capabilities have gotten so good that we are actually able to take advantage of these materials. Whereas historically in the, the 50s and 60s for rutile and then in the 70s for uh, 60s and 70s for strontium titanate, they were just using the same cutting techniques as everything else, like the same design techniques. And that really wasn't taking advantage of these extreme optical properties. Could I ask you just to clarify for everybody, because not everybody the cutter here, uh, what the computer 
is doing like I, I my under, limited understanding is it's taking the refractive index of the stone hardness and so on and, and it computes the best angles to facet is that what it's doing um so that's that's a very common misconception uh but give me a quick second and i will pull something up for you um uh, just give me a moment all right so i'm going to share my screen here again if i can get it to work properly All right, so you should be able to see my screen now. So this is the most common currently used software, um, Gemcut Studio. I'm just gonna change a couple of settings here. So the way that this software works is it pulls up your design over here, and then it creates basically a virtual lighting source away from the stone. It uses the refractive index and dispersion that you put in, and then generates a live viewing of what the stone will look like here. So here, this is a synthetic brew tile, one of my own custom designs, and you can see that it's just vomiting rainbows everywhere. Unfortunately, there is no good way to optimize, like there's no computer software that currently exists that will automatically change the angles to achieve a certain effect that you want. So a lot of this is actually, um, trial and error that's dependent on the faceter's judgment or the designer's judgment. So for example, here is a window that changes the angles of the crown and the pavilion just by 5% each time. So if I'm working on a design and I'm trying to achieve a certain effect, I actually have to go into this software, manually look through every one of these and decide, okay, what special, like which one of these looks the way that I want it to? Like, do I want something that looks like this over at the top right? Or do I want to change it and get something that looks kind of ridiculous and strange like this? Or do I want uh, even more dispersion and pick something where there's just much more of it? Um, so the software that we have now is really, um, it's very trial and error heavy. You're back. Were you able to see the screen that I was sharing and like hear all that? Yeah. Okay, good. Any oh, other yeah. questions? Yes. Can we can we snoop on that last software that you showed us? Oh yeah, like, sure. Can you, can you show us like going from a very low dispersion to a very high one so we can see that effect? Absolutely. All right. So Right now, I've modeled this uh, this stone in rutile. So here is the stone. Like I've set the refractive index to be two point six two, which is that of rutile. But here's what it would look like with no dispersion. Here's what it would look like with the dispersion of diamond. So you can see a little bit of these flashes of like green and blue and red coming through, but there's not that much. We'll try moistenite. So you can see there's a little bit more of these flashes. You can see some blue, some red, some green, and it's definitely more than the last one, but it's still not that impressive. Let's try strontium titanate. So that's one of our very high dispersion synthetics. And you can see that now you're really seeing a lot of that play of color come in. You're seeing a lot of that internal fire. But even that doesn't really compare to Rutile, which is just the most ridiculous, just comically rainbowish. So that kind of gives you a live walkthrough. You can also do the same thing with refractive index. So as you lower the refractive index, you're gonna see very different effects. So right here, kind of dark, unpleasant, and this is, um, uh this is topaz not really the most interesting still somewhat interesting but definitely got some windows in there we'll bump it up to let's say white sapphire and now you see it's livelier you're definitely seeing some interesting effects going on uh, i would cut this in sapphire let's go up to let's say zircon and here we're starting to see weird things happen in the corner um 
Again, that's why it's so important to use computer modeling for any of the high refractive index, high dispersion gemstones, because sometimes, even if you're using a classic design, like a standard round brilliant, there might be effects that you wouldn't know about unless you ran this computer modeling. So there's no point in cutting a gemstone in a pre-existing design for the wrong material and running the risk of something bad happening. So here, can, you, up, can, can you also change it from like um, top view to side view? Yep. Um, so you can do that in this uh, rendering, or you can do it in here with the wireframe of the stone. So here's the stone from the side, top view, bottom view. Wow. And then just uh, as an example, uh, there's this urban legend that kind of floats around for gem cutters that says if you've got a design that works well in a low refractive material like quartz or emerald or something like that, supposedly it'll always look good in high materials, but that's just definitively untrue. So here I've picked um, GGG, which has a very high refractive index. And to be quite honest, there's these giant dark areas in this stone, and it just it does not look good. But if we go down to topaz, which is very low, it does look good. So that's just another one of these urban legends that keeps floating around. That's uh, we're working to stamp them out, but it just uh, they keep cropping up. Does that also mean that you can scan that in, and that you, it will detect what all those variables are? So the scanning technology is still in development. There are some scanners where you can actually use your cell phone and take um, a bunch of pictures of the gemstone and it'll import that picture. Like you'll, you'll be able to use the actual shape of the gemstone that you've got in hand. But that technology is really, as of right now, only really used by the diamond industry because it's so expensive and it's so difficult to get to work properly. Um, when it's used in the diamond industry, they use laser scanners, and that actually shows you inclusions as well. But for us kind of here on the ground who just have cell phones, uh, technology isn't quite good enough to do that yet. Sorry, I have another question too. I don't want to ask questions so other people can't answer, but you know there's a, a paint museum. I think it's at Harvard or, or the Sestonian Institute. And so they have pigments all through history and they have samples of them. So when someone says it dates something, they go back to see if the paint could be valid. So when you were talking about these different labs that are creating uh, different specimens, of course they're for profit and they're industry secrets of how they actually, the, the complete process. So they probably would not want to document that publicly, but is there, uh, uh, sort of like the, the will globally to have a database that will list, like will, that will put samples in. So historically they can't go 10 years time and go backwards and say, um, this is what we were producing 10 years ago. This uh, gemstone was produced at our lab. Yeah. So there are a couple of testing companies that have that. So first off, the Natural, Museum, uh, Natural History Museum in the UK has pieces of basically every synthetic produced from 19 or no from 1877 to 1950 something um, in terms of the chemistry we don't have a database like that but in terms of the spectroscopy which is actually a little bit more valuable because you can use that to calculate things um, what is it it's um, magi gems out of Finland has a database of essentially every synthetic ever produced. Um, their collection isn't complete, like it's not 100% complete, but they have every piece of material ever produced by Tyrus, which was a hydrothermal um, sapphire and emerald company that is now just producing emeralds. And they've got, I believe, almost every piece of material ever produced by uh, Java company, which was in Switzerland. Most of the materials produced by Roost Gems, by Byron. Um, I think they have their collection of Kyosura material from Japan isn't complete, but it's, it's up there. So yeah, there's definitely groups that are doing this. Um, 
and now like in the modern era when everybody has internet and people are able to like upload things easily it's become a lot easier for us to develop these collections but there's no definitive complete collection yet and i think in the next couple of years just given how um, how interested people are in having a resource like that it would not surprise me to see that we get a complete collection right now we have a, a, what, a very complete co collection of naturally occurring gem information on gemdat.org and i'm sort of thinking aloud here that it might be interesting if it's possible without too much trouble and, and maybe through cooperation and through organizations that have databases to actually aggregate the synthetic information as well onto um, gemdat.org. Uh, I don't, I'm since it's a database, I don't know if, how difficult that would be, but it's a freely available, no, no charge um, uh, database, which I think would be very enhanced if we get, add the, the separating kind of uh, and the distinctive data of, of synthetics. Yeah. Um, Ray, send me an email to remind me of that. And I will talk to uh, Miko Astrom and Alberto Scarani about that. Um, I'm also chatting with uh, Aaron Palapi from GIA at Tucson. So I will bring that up to him as well, because he's one of the like heads of colored stone research. It's funny you should mention Aaron Palapi, because uh, just by way of, of a segue, our next program that will be on the 26th of February. Uh, we'll be having Aaron Palke and um, George Rossman, both world-renowned experts on color, talking about uh, color change in gems. So, yeah, he is the nice. guy. Okay. Uh, yeah, send me that email to remind me. And then um, just for the sake of time, I'm going to go through the last of the questions that people have typed into the chat. Um, and then I'm actually going to go try to finish your floor right before my flight tomorrow. <laughs> oh, that's um, important. Uh, <laughs> if, if it gets finished, Ray, um, one of the facet junctions keeps chipping, so I'm trying to work around that or figure something out. But uh, well, anyway, so I see a question from David Spencer. I see you like fivefold symmetry. Is there a reason for that? The answer is yes. Um, odd symmetry, typically fivefold and sevenfold, give you substantially more interesting, not necessarily better, because better is subjective, but it gives you more interesting or more unique contrast patterns that you can't get in even numbered symmetry, like um, six fold or eight fold or round stones. So I typically pick five fold symmetry because it's personally easier to work with, but also because it's able to get those effects. The other thing is that visible fire in a gemstone is just substantially easier to get in a five-fold symmetry design or a seven-fold symmetry design. Um, looking at, uh, oh, okay, Forbes Pigment Collection. Um, yeah, Maggie Labs is uh, Miko and Alberto's company that uh, does um, the Raman spectroscopy, UV vis near IR spectroscopy and photoluminescence. Uh, cool. I think that's everybody's questions. Um, if you've got another question uh, and you can ask it in like two minutes, then feel free to ask another question. Otherwise, at uh, at exactly 4.30 my local time, which is four minutes from now, I'm going to bounce and go finish the stone that I'm supposed to get done for Ray. Well, can everybody unmute for one second, please? Thank you, Aria. Uh, that was extremely enlightening. Much appreciated, David. If, if everybody could unmute for just a second, please. Because, oh, someone talk. No, just somebody has background noise. Anyway, I just want to. So much background noise. So much background noise. Yeah. Anyway. Oh, great. Thank you very much. <laughs> much appreciated, everyone. Thanks for having me. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank, you, you, very you, much, so much. Thank you so much. Come back. Thank you so much. And then uh, just feel free to email me if you have any other questions if you want to ask offline. I was so hoping that you'd say that. <laughs> Thanks very much for your talk, already. Absolutely. Take care. All right. Uh, everyone have a good rest of your day. And uh, I will uh, see that talk on uh, next month.
I have a quick personal question if you're still there, Ariane. Yeah, go for are it. you are you a plastic surgeon in Chapel Hill? Uh not in Chapel Hill any longer. Oh, okay. I used to work at Duke. That's oh gotcha. Yeah. I worked I worked worked with Larry Marks, who's in radiation oncology in Chapel Hill. Gotcha. Yeah. Uh no, I was uh, I was at uh at UNC and have since moved to Canada. Whereabouts? Toronto. Okay. I'm in Calgary. Nice. I used to live in Toronto. I used to work at Princess Margaret oh, Hospital. Awesome. Yeah. That's uh that's like a 20 minute drive away from my house. We've been chasing each other around the world. I'll wait for you in Calgary. Gotcha. Anyway, thank you very much, Aria. Thank you everyone for attending. And I'll look forward to uh, to a, um, a more efficiently run program next month. Sorry about the delays and things happen this, this month. Sometimes, you know. Uh, Tucson and things get in the way of, of programming, and I approach. I apologize for any inconvenience it might have caused, and to you as well, uh, thank Aria. Thank you, Aria. Very See you, everyone. You folks enjoyed Thanks Tucson. So